Good morning. Thank you for joining this webinar titled Unknown 300 Webinar. My name is Kyler, and I will be the host and moderator for today's webinar. You can submit your questions at any time using the Q&A window on the right side of the screen, and we will have a Q&A session at the end of the presentation. If you'd like to view the presentation in the full screen format, click the full screen button. You can toggle back to the previous view by clicking the same button. Our presenter today is Marie Hathar, Chief Marketing Officer, Checkpoint Software Technologies, LTD. We are now ready to get started, so I'll turn it over to Marie. Great. Thank you so much, Kyler. Hello, I'm Marie Hattar with Checkpoint Software Technologies. Unknown malware is the topic of today, and in particular, a test against 300 unknown malware that were used to assess how well vendors did against these unknown attacks. But first, a little bit of background on the topic of malware. From the first self-replicating viruses of the 1980s, to the more sophisticated worms and emails that have delivered viruses through the 90s, threats have been growing more and more sophisticated and more intelligent every year. When we hit the 2000s, you had adware, spyware, keyloggers, and distributed denial of service, or DDoS, attacks. Those also dramatically increased, both in frequency and in complexity. By 2014, there are now well over 100,000 malware variants that are attacking computer systems daily today. So here's an example of how this could work. It's actually an all too common occurrence. Take for example one of your employees who takes his work laptop home every night and one day she decides to use it to watch the movies. So she downloads what she thinks is popcorn time. After all, they all look the same, right? And what is a torrent anyway? She watches the movie, gets her computer infected, and then uses this computer back at work, just as she always does. But unfortunately, it's not as usual. Without the proper safeguards that make malware, without the proper safeguards, that malware that has infected her machine can now migrate into the whole company network and through lateral attacks infect the whole company. And then the problems just get bigger. That's just a very typical scenario that we see every day. Here's another example. It's your lucky day. A vendor just handed you a thumb drive at the conference. You didn't want their product, but hey, you could totally use a new thumb drive. So you figure you'll just erase it and use it for your own data. You know, I've done this myself. The problem is, what you don't know is that it might be infected. And before you know it, your device is infected, and then you take it to work, and now you infect your whole network. You think this can't happen? It already did. In 2008, the agent BSD malware's claim to fame is that it temporarily forced the Pentagon to issue a blanket ban on thumb drives and even contributed to the creation of an entirely new military department, the US Cyber Command. Agent.btz spreads through infected thumb drives and it, it actually installs malware that steals data. Here's yet another scenario. Consider the bored soldier that's enticed by what everyone says is the most intensive first-person shooter game on the market. And even better, it's free. All the other guys have downloaded it, so he or she does too on their work laptop. There's a lot of downtime between patrols. Their infected machine has now infected the local tactical operations center. Next we know it's reached the Pentagon servers. Think this can't happen? It also already has. In 2011, the Pentagon discovered an unknown virus in a key predator flight control center. How it got there, what it did, and its full impact was never released. But do you want to take a chance with the control of the world's most lethal weapon system? Networks need protection against all types of threats. 
What I just discussed were three possible but very real scenarios. What it highlights is that we have to be very proactive against these growing threats. No network is actually immune to attack, and infections can happen. As such, a two-pronged strategy is very important. One that prevents malware infiltration, and one that once it realizes that no one is immune, it can mitigate the damage should malware actually gain access to your network. We call these strategies pre-infection and post-infection defense strategies. Since attackers are hiding malware inside documents, websites, hosts, and networks, it's important to protect your network from attacks before they happen, before they occur, and for you to have the protections in place for the rare occurrence when, infect, when an infection actually manages to slip through. Now, there are three basic categories of malware. Threats that we know about, threats we suspect might be a problem, but we don't know exactly what form they will take, and three, threats that we haven't even considered. According to the 2014 Checkpoint Annual Security Report, organizations experience 53 pieces of unknown malware every day. These threats are actually unknown unknowns, and unfortunately, the only way to understand what they may do to your network is to try them out and let them run in a protected or emulated environment and see if they create any damage. This is usually called threat emulation or sandboxing in the industry. An organization has to defend against all three types of malware, the known knowns, the known unknowns, and the unknown unknowns. To do this effectively requires several layers of protection that can be used to prevent attacks. Tools like antivirus programs and intrusion prevention systems are good for stopping known malware and known vulnerabilities. They inspect incoming data against signature databases of known threats and known threat profiles, and they stop them before they actually reach your network. Anti-bot programs detect bot-infected machines, and so they prevent network damage from infected devices. And lastly, threat emulation stops unknown or zero-day malware from entering your network. These multiple layers of protection ensure that your network is protected from both the vast database of known signatures that are trying to enter your network, from infected machines inside your network trying to connect to a command center, and lastly, from unknown malware that could be trying to sneak into your network. In 2012, Checkpoint established ThreatCloud, a collaborative platform to fight cybercrime. ThreatCloud translates threat intelligence into protections to detect malware before it enters your network and it prevents it. Threat Cloud is supported by the largest global network of intelligence sources. It aggregates multiple sources to create a master list of known threat signatures and is capable of analyzing incoming files in real time against that database. Giving you a quick overview of Threat Cloud or at a glance, it really uses an enormous uh, threat intelligence database that looks at these signatures daily from, a, daily from a variety of intelligence sources. It uses Checkpoint's own internal research team. It is collecting data from a network of worldwide sensors that are sitting in the various gateways. It's uh, getting input from community analysis as well as industry threat feeds. The Threat Cloud database is created by evaluating the inputs from thousands of these different sensors. And it, if you think about what Checkpoint has, it has some of the most extensive gateways out there. So we're able to collect a, real, a lot of real life data. And so once it gets all of that data, it actually can synthesize it into protections. In addition, over 250 million addresses are analyzed each day, and more than half a million new threat signatures and malware-infected sites are added to this threat signature list. Currently, ThreatCloud has a catalog of over 14 million known malware-infested sites and signatures. So it is a very, very big data-centric 
threat cloud that really understands what's going out there in terms of the industry and the potential malware that can affect companies. Now, a key element of the threat cloud architecture is the threat emulation engine. Threat emulation inspects all incoming files, and it emulates a host environment. So it acts as if it's like your computer to test what a file might do. If the file shows some malware characteristic, the file is prevented from entering your network, and a signature is identified of that file, and it's captured and created. And then that signature is added to the Threat Cloud database. Threat Cloud is the fastest, most comprehensive threat protection solution on the market. And as a result of that, we thought it would be interesting to put this to the test and see how it does against unknown malware. With all the different competing threat emulation solutions that are out there and everyone claiming to offer full protection, how do you evaluate which solution would be the best against unknown malware? At Checkpoint, we decided to devise a test. Now, this was our test, freely admitted. We did this in-house. But we encourage all of you to try this for yourself if you have a, a safe environment to test this out and if you have a few vendor boxes that you might be evaluating. What we did is we tested our Checkpoint threat emulation system against other security vendors, such as FireEye, Palo Alto Networks, and Fortinet. We created a test structure that started with 300 known malware files that we just got from Google's VirusTotal site. We selected a variety of file types where some were PDF, some were doc, and some were portable executable files. All 300 of these files were classified as malicious by more than 10 antivirus engines, including all of the other vendors that were used in this test. Since these files were known, and had identified signatures, we used a very simple technique to change them and slightly modify them without actually changing the malicious intent of the malware. For example, we added a space or we changed the checksum so that the threat signature was no longer considered known. This made all these files unknown. We then presented these files to each of the four security vendors tested. The results were eye-opening. Checkpoint captured 100% of the unknown malware files. FireEye came in second at 70%. Palo Alto Networks captured 62%, and Fortinet only captured 27%. But given that it only takes one file getting past your defenses to take down your network, is anything, is anything less than the best acceptable? In this case, 70%, 62%, 27% are all the same. They are a huge risk to your business. All of these competing solutions are letting malicious files into your network. When you're thinking about selecting any network security solution, you really need to consider several key features. Does the solution provide multiple layers of protection? And how well does it identify and reject both known and unknown malware before it enters your network? Does it inspect SSL traffic? More and more of the traffic that we see today is using SSL. Does it detect malware only, or does it also prevent it from entering your network? Many vendors will uh, detect the malware, but in the meantime, by the time they've detected it, they've also let it into the network, so it could actually do a fair bit of damage. Does your solution inspect archive tile types? And does it inspect files that are both large and small? You know, we all work with a variety of file types. Uh, many of us use Exchange, and how often do we get 10, 15 uh, megabit uh, PowerPoints that come into our inbox? So you really need to make sure that whatever solution you have can look at file types of all sizes. And Ultimately, what you need to be able to answer is that a good protection solution will say yes to all those features and all those questions. 
some of the findings that we saw in the unknown 300 test involved more than just discovering how many files weren't detected by our competition. We also evaluated what types of files could elude these competing vendors. Palo Alto, for instance, doesn't inspect PDF files over one megabyte. If a malware file is bigger than that, it'll pass right by the Palo Alto filters. We also discovered that both Palo Alto and Fortinet only detect malware, but actually let it through. They can't prevent it from entering the network. So it's only after a substantial amount of time that they start blocking it. Also, FireEye doesn't even scan inside SSL traffic, meaning that malware can be embedded inside a simulated SSL stream. And Palo Alto doesn't inspect archive files such as .rar. So in that sense, malware can actually hide and disguise itself. If a simple test could find these vulnerabilities, think what a focused, well-funded cyber criminal could leverage to get inside your network. Here are some other interesting insights we gained from the test. Palo Alto takes 30 minutes to update its signatures, and Fortinet takes even longer. With the speed of malware propagation, 30 minutes might as well be forever. Checkpoint updates in real time, closing possible vulnerabilities to your network as soon as they're known. We also noted that FireEye needs a separate appliance for email and web protection. That's two appliances to buy, two to manage, two to maintain. With Checkpoint, multiple protocol scanning is actually accomplished in the one device or one gateway. Now, don't take our word for it. You can simulate this test. You can work with our partners to give you some sample data that you can try out. And you can actually try threat emulation for yourself through this link that's identified here, www.checkpoint.com slash campaign slash threat cloud dash emulation slash index dot html. We encourage you to try this out, send up a file, see whether it's malicious or not. In summary, we know malware is growing both in scope and in depth, and we know that it's growing both in known and unknown malware. We know that the optimal way to detect unknown malware is through threat emulation, where you can actually see what it's going to do in your environment, what it's going to do in your network, and then based on that, see what damage it may cause, and if so, know that it's malicious and then stop it. And lastly, we know that when you evaluate different engine choices, selecting the one with the best catch rate makes the most sense if you're trying to ensure a secure environment. I'd like to thank you for listening to this webcast, and I'd like to at this point open up the floor for any questions you may have. Okay, one of the questions that has come in, it said, I noticed that WebSense is not listed for comparison in your test results. How does it compare to WebSense? Thank you. Um, so we only tested uh, vendors whose products we actually had in our labs. There are many other products out there uh, that we didn't have uh, available for us to test. But if you have the WebSense product, um, we can easily, or one of our partners can provide you with the files and you can run this test uh, you know, sort of in a, in a safe lab environment. Another question is, uh, is this Prezo available? It will be made available post this webcast, and we'll follow up uh, with an email to the attendees on uh, its location. Another question that's up there is, how long does it take to do an emulation? So, uh, in terms of uh, that, that question, there's two aspects in emulation. There's the time it actually takes to emulate a file, and there's the time that it actually takes to propagate the protection once it knows that it's a bad file to the security gateways. Uh, this emulation time really varies by the different vendors. Uh, for example, uh, for Checkpoint, it takes us about 60 to 70 seconds to do 
the threat emulation. For most of the other vendors, it's a lot longer. Uh, but even more important is how long does it actually take to uh, propagate that emulation to the gateways, because that's really when um, they're all updated with a signature to provide ongoing protection. Uh, but uh, different vendors have different times that they publish for their emulations. Okay, let's see. Uh, another question, what files does your sandboxing solution support? Today we support Microsoft Office, Adobe PDF, and executables, even within archives. In all uh, over, we support about 20 different file types. We are continuing to add support for other file types, and this is done seamlessly with an update to the emulation engine. For instance, since we first ran this test, uh, our engine now supports the inspection of .zip, .7z, and .tar archives, in addition to, say, the .rar files that we actually used in this test. Okay, question is, how does the anti-bot blade differ from the normal bot signatures in the IDS, IPS blade? Um, so there's different signatures uh, that are, are done. So for example, when you look at IDS or IPS, those are known signature attacks of, uh, of different, uh, uh, you know, sort of malware. With anti-bot, it's really looking much more so for it's assuming that something has come into your network and potentially infected it and is looking to see if uh, any communication is trying to happen to the command and control from within the network. So that's where it's providing that protection. It reports uh, if your machine is trying to call outside to somewhere it shouldn't be. Uh, another question, in order to scan SSL, is there a complicated SSL certificate and proxy setup involved? And the answer is no. Uh, another question, does the emulation impact the performance of my gateway? Uh, the answer is again no, because we do the emulation either in the cloud or locally on a dedicated threat emulation appliance. So there's no performance hit other than what uh, is incurred for doing antivirus inspections. Uh, another question, what other security technologies besides threat emulation are used to detect threats? Since threats were all made unknown, um, the other security technologies such as antivirus wouldn't be effective against it. So um, in this uh, case, it was threat emulation that was used. Uh, all files that were sent, the 300, were all emulated to determine if they were malicious. Okay, one other question. What information is provided back to me after emulating a file? A detailed report is actually returned to you that includes the file details, any abnormal activity details, and the actual runtime screenshots of the sandbox environment. Uh, another uh, a question is asking to repost the link to send uh, the sample. I'm assuming you mean the sample malware files or where you can get them. We'll also include that in an email to the attendees as to where um, we uh, can, uh, where you can get uh, some potential samples for this. Uh, 
Uh, another question is, is, if emulation takes 60 seconds and more, or how does that impact delivery of the file? In fact, you block bad content. So different vendors have a different approach to this. Some vendors actually just let the content write through while they run the emulation, and others uh, will hold it while the emulation is being run and determining whether the file is malicious or not. At Checkpoint, uh, we prefer to create a more secure environment. And because we do the emulation really quickly, uh, our fundamental belief is we want to provide security to businesses out there and organizations out there. So uh, we actually hold the content and block it till it's completed its run through the emulation. Uh, Fortinet, for example, and Palo Alto networks let the traffic through, and it's after some significant time that uh, they actually then um, will start blocking it once they determine that it's malicious. Uh, FireEye, uh, also similar to us, actually uh, can hold it uh, while the emulation is being run. Another question, um, does this require a new appliance? Can I use my existing firewall to do this? Um, the 12500 uh, 12 is what you have. Okay, I was going to say you're introducing some new firewalls to us that uh, I wasn't familiar with. Um, but uh, yes, your existing firewall can absolutely do this. Uh, you can either use the cloud service, or if you want to run it locally, then you would need to add that software blade. But your existing firewall can absolutely do this. All you need is a software blade for threat emulation if you want to run it locally. All right, at this point, I'd like to turn it back to the moderator in terms of uh, closing out the questions. And uh, we can also send you a copy of the 300 test report as well as a, re a link to this replay, uh, and that will come to you with a follow-on email. Thank you again for joining us and uh, listening to this webcast. Kyler, over back to you. Thank you, Marie. Um, for your reference, this webinar has been recorded and will be available for on-demand viewing on the Checkpoint website. You will receive an email in the next few days with a link to the recorded presentation. Thank you for joining us for this webinar and have a great day.